I was woken up at 7 a.m. by my husband saying, hey, just as a heads up, you know, just so you don't freak out, you're, they're shooting at both. Went straight to the nearest um, donation spot, and they asked, you know, have you had sex with a man? You know, yeah, don't want to lie. And she said, okay, well, we're going to stop right there. You can't donate blood. After a deadly mass shooting in 2016 at Pulse, an LGBT plus nightclub in Florida, volunteers lined up to donate blood to survivors. But because of certain rules, some of those volunteers soon found out they weren't allowed. In the US, if you're a gay or bisexual man, or simply a man who has sex with other men, also known as MSM, you have to abstain from sex for a whole year before you're allowed to give blood. But for most other people, these rules don't apply. And donating is a pretty straightforward thing to do, providing you're in good health. In this video, we're asking why all the restrictions around gay men donating blood? And do they have a place anymore in 2020? Well, it's complicated. It's all to do with the screening of HIV and some rules that were introduced in the 1980s, which we'll get to later. And to make things more complicated, the rules change depending on which country you're in. Finally, we'll be looking at whether the decisions around blood donation are based on science or prejudice. So, let's get started. Up until the 1980s, there were no restrictions on gay men donating blood in America and the UK. So what changed? In 1981, doctors noted a number of gay men in Los Angeles showing symptoms of a rare type of pneumonia. It turns out this would be the first official account of what we know today as HIV, and AIDS, a condition you can contract from having HIV. For a brief time, the condition was called GRID, gay-related immune deficiency, after it was suggested the cause of the virus was sexual from 81 on, it was all over the news. People were reacting with such horror and thereby treating gay men, for the most part, so terribly, you know, as if they were just simply vectors of disease and not human beings. Mary worked as a nurse in San Francisco during the first few years of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. We couldn't stop this awful train from coming at the time. We could not prevent people's deaths, but what we could do was help them to feel cared about. Science and fear and homophobia kind of all intersected. The fear was so great that New York City buried hundreds of people who died from AIDS-related illnesses in unmarked mass graves on the state's remote Heart Island. Some medical professionals refused to work with HIV-positive patients because they were so scared of getting infected. But not everyone bought into the fear. Princess Diana, she made headlines for simply doing this, shaking the hand of a patient with AIDS without wearing gloves, a powerful gesture that helped enormously to combat the stigma surrounding the condition at the time. Maybe because we see science evolve sometimes, like, well, they think this is how, you, how it gets transmitted, but what if they're wrong? Women, children, and heterosexual men were starting to get diagnosed too. But then scientists made an important breakthrough, discovering that HIV was transmitted by certain bodily fluids, including blood and semen. But by this point, thousands of people had already contracted the virus. This was after patients with blood disorders, such as haemophilia, who were given contaminated blood plasma products, taken from high-risk donors, including prisoners and drug addicts, who were paid to give blood. From the late 1970s to the mid-1980s, about half of all people with haemophilia in the US became infected with HIV after using contaminated blood products. An estimated 90% of those with severe haemophilia became HIV positive. The repercussions of this scandal are felt to this day, with thousands of families and individuals around the world seeking compensation. So governments started stepping in to tighten the rules around giving blood, in some cases completely banning gay men from donating. America and France introduced a lifetime ban on men giving blood in 1983. Two years later, the UK did the same, and it wasn't long before others followed suit. So nearly 40 years on, how have things changed? At least 19 countries still implement lifetime bans, including China, Ukraine, Lebanon and Iceland. But others have moved towards what's known as a deferral period. Let's take the UK, for example which has a deferral period of three months. Here's what that means. The deferral period means that for gay men, uh, they have to wait three months from the time they last had sex before they're allowed to um, 
donate blood. If somebody's recently acquired an infection, such as HIV, there is a small period of time, usually for most people just a number of weeks, where the virus can be there but is not detectable on a test. These deferral periods change depending which country you're in. Canada also has a three-month waiting time. Compare that then to Taiwan, where the deferral period is five years. That's right, no sex for five years. So what evidence are these bans and deferral periods based on? And does it stack up anymore? Most people, including LGBT plus campaigners, say these old rules that limit gay blood donations just don't have a place in this day and age, because they still focus too heavily on sexual orientation and not on science, which has advanced a lot. We say that there's a disparity there, which says an individual in that group who's a gay and bisexual man could actually be safe to donate blood in contrast to others who go and donate blood who may not have been responsible in their sexual behaviour. Thanks to medical science and huge progress in international cooperation, we now know a lot more about HIV and AIDS, how to test for it, how to prevent it from spreading, and how to treat it. Today, all blood, regardless of the donor, goes through rigorous testing for any pathogens, including hepatitis A, B, C, syphilis, and yes, HIV. You now have modern blood screening technology like the P24 antigen test and the NAAT, which can detect HIV within 15 to 20 days, while clinical guidelines from the British HIV Association advise a 45-day window period to be diagnosable, much shorter than the three-month wait the UK currently has in place. This way, blood that tests positive for infection can be caught before any contamination of the donation stream happens. We're seeing really big drops uh, in HIV diagnoses uh, in gay men. And that experience, I think, has to inform the debate that's going on around risk assessment for blood donation. In the UK, for example, new HIV diagnoses have been falling across the board, but most dramatically among gay and bisexual men which dropped by 71% between 2012 and 2018. That's down to a rise in the number of people getting tested and the use of effective treatment like PrEP to prevent HIV. So if the testing of HIV is now more advanced and we know the virus can affect pretty much anybody, is there really any need for deferral periods and bans for just one group of people? So I think the question that we need to ask now is, is it safe? to reduce that waiting period further. And work is going on at the moment uh, to address exactly that question. A handful of countries have changed the way they do things with the aim of moving towards having no deferral period at all. As of 2020, around 17 countries have no wait time, which means gay men can freely give blood without restrictions, providing they're in good health. Like Italy, for example. Since 2001, they have ripped up the rules so that the donor's sexuality isn't a factor when it comes to giving blood. Instead, they use risk-based questionnaires and one-on-one -on -one consultations with medical professionals to check a person's eligibility. 20 years on, and the data shows that this approach hasn't affected blood safety. Other countries have been looking at their own systems as well. Some have relaxed their laws around gay blood donation and have put new checks in place based on the latest scientific research. Another example, South Africa. They lifted their ban entirely in 2014, so that sexual orientation is not a factor when it comes to donating blood. Often the science is ahead of the policy, and I think that's why it's important that um, experts in the field, experts in assessing HIV risk, and experts uh, that come from the LGBT community are able to inform this approach. This year, France and Denmark will let gay men donate blood after a four-month waiting period. Meanwhile in America, the lifetime ban was lifted in 2015 and replaced with a 12-month deferral. The American Red Cross says it wants to see a three-month deferral. And further down the line, an overall ban on using sexuality as a means test for giving blood. So to wrap up, why is this something that everybody should care about? Put simply, blood is in short supply around the world. According to the World Health Organization, 119 countries don't have enough blood to meet their medical needs. India is the worst hit, where demand outstrips supply by more than 400%. And in the US, it was estimated that if the blood ban on MSM was lifted, there would be at least 600,000 extra pints of blood donated every year. There are potentially thousands of gay men out there who want to make this incredible gesture and aren't allowed to do so because of those restrictions. One pint of blood has the potential to save up to three lives, so there's a massive human cost to keeping it out of circulation if it's healthy. And saving lives is what the whole blood donation system 
with its many checks and balances, is there to do. Some countries where there are higher levels of stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV or people who are gay and bisexual are perhaps less likely to have more open-minded approaches to blood donation. We need to, everywhere around the world, we need to ensure that HIV stigma, discrimination uh, against people living with HIV or the groups who are affected by HIV is not impacting on policy decisions. But let's not just treat a, a whole group as a, a monolithic um, kind of risk as opposed to an individual who has the potential to do something incredible and donate blood.